people in the DC area. Wow, so okay. I've been listening to all this and I'm a big gardener, so. Mm -hmm. okay. Good, well, let me share my screen and we'll get right into the presentation. Then we'll have a little discussion afterwards if, you, if, uh, if people want to. So I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> hmm, wrong screen. There we go. So the topic is water and climate. The, so let's talk about water and climate, how and why water is neglected in the mainstream climate conversation. This presentation part will take about maybe 20 minutes or so. So the main point is, you know, do we want to solve, I'm gonna to have to put this over a little bit. Do we want to solve climate change uh, or do, you, do we just want to talk about it? If we want to solve the problem, then we must talk about water. We can't talk only about CO2. We can't talk only about greenhouse gas emissions. We must talk about water if we're going to solve the problem about, of climate change. And if we do that, then we'll solve a lot of other problems in, in, along the way. Ne next slide. So the question is, what kind of conversation are we having versus the conversation we need to be having? Are we having the conversation that we need to be having, or are we having a conversation that's kind of different from what we need to be having? So I got four items here, next four slides. The conversation we are having is we're focusing solely on CO2, baby. If you know anything about climate change, you know it's all about CO2. At least that's the conversation that you hear. But the conversation we need to be having is that we need to be talking about water. We need to be talking about water cycles. We need to be talking about land use because that's where ecosystems occur. And uh, so next slide, the conversation we are having is reduce emissions, baby. We need to reduce those emissions. We're narrowly focused on reducing those fossil fuel emissions. We need to be having a conversation about land management because land management is where water cycles, we make or break the water cycles in our land management, whether it's landscaping, farming, uh, urban planning, or forests. So the conversation we're having is we're gonna get off of fossil fuels. We're narrowly focused on getting off of fossil fuels. The sad thing is we're, you know, there's nothing in our foreseeable future that's going to actually get us off of fossil fuels. It's not going to happen, which is another conversation. But the sad thing is that we're talking about fossil fuels, but nothing coming down the pike is going to make that happen. The conversation we need to be having is holistic solutions. We need to be talking about what is the big picture? What is the real problem? And not just from a natural standpoint, but also from the standpoint of what I call governance, like how are we governing? How are we making decisions? Are we making decisions in anything remotely like the way that needs to happen if we're going to actually solve this problem? Next slide. The conversation we are having is about 100% renewable energy, baby. We're going to get to 100% renewable energy, which to me is pure fantasy. It's not going to happen. I'm for reducing fossil fuels by 75%. And to me, that can be done without the use of renewable energy. I don't think renewable energy is a thing. I think it's a, a, it's a, it's a, string, it's a long string of empty promises. I'm not saying solar panels are bad or wrong. I'm saying we're being led down a path and we're being engaged in a conversation that is not going to result in 100% renewable energy or anything close to it. So we need to be talking about holistic solutions. Now, water governs, I'm gonna put this maybe down here, see if that works. Water governs 95% uh, of the heat dynamics on the earth. So we're, ta you know, we're talking about global warming, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about too much heat in the atmosphere. If water governs 95% of the heat, 
uh, in the atmosphere and in the ocean? Shouldn't we be talking about water? And yet we're not. What's up with that? So, so what are we going to do about this? If water governs 95% of the heat dynamics on the earth, what are we going to do about this? So the, what follows is some big ideas related to water and climate. One A, we've got about six ideas here. Some of them are divided up into one A, B, C, that kind of thing. One A, weather extremes are the result of broken water cycles. Read the news. See the everything on TV and on YouTube. We've got these, you know, flooding, droughts, hurricanes, famines, uh, and uh, and did I say flooding, flood, drought, heat waves, hurricanes, famines, forest fires. These are a result of bro. Each one of these, at some level, is a result of broken water cycles. So you would think. That if we have all this drought and it's a, if it's a result of broken water cycles, we would be talking about the different causes of drought and how we can fix the drought and not just blame it all on CO2. So weather extremes are the result of broken water cycles. And these are examples. Flooding is a broken water cycle. Flooding is not a natural thing. Flooding is a man-made phenomenon. It results from removing all the plant matter, too much pavement, that kind of thing. We can fix it, but it's a broken water cycle. And we shouldn't be blaming it all on climate change, meaning CO2. Same thing with drought. Uh, talked about that. Heat waves, insofar as heat waves are, you know, are heat waves not a result of broken water cycle? Insofar as Water cycles, if we restored water cycles, it could create microclimates. It would have a cooling effect in our urban areas, a cooling effect on our agricultural lands. So, and also forest fires, surely forest fires would not be as strong as in, or as, as, as intense if there was more water in the forest. So to some extent, to some extent, forest fires are a result of broken water cycles. So what are some of the solutions to this? We're only going to talk about there. I'm going to name like five potential solutions. We're only going to talk about two of them. And but we're, more plant matter. There's nothing like more plant matter and better soil health are the two things that it's not. It, it, this is the low hanging fruit. This is what we could do if we did less, you know, some respects we need to do less. Joel Salatin said the tragedy of human experience is not that we're lazy, it's that we're busy doing the wrong things. We're busy too much mowing, too much plowing, too much deforestation, too much construction, absent any type of plan for how to do it ecologically. <laughs> so uh small earthworks is another like plant matter soil health small earthworks like small ponds swales key line system we won't get into that today but that's just whole ecosystems so, you know, respecting the entire ecosystem not just planting trees not just planting this or planting that or letting this or that grow but attending to the whole ecosystem and then lastly, no toxins. If we can lay off the toxins, we will do a, that, that's an important component of restoring our water cycles. So next slide. Water governs 95% of the Earth's heat dynamics via these following things. So transpiration is, is one of the fancy term. I was gonna wait and put this at the end but it kind of comes first in the process. So transpiration, just think perspiration. People and some animals sweat. Transpiration is how trees and plants sweat. It's how they give off water. And if we're gonna restore water cycles, plants do most of the work. So we're going to revegetate, grow plant matter, so that there's more plants that can transpire. We also have evaporation. Evaporation is, is, you know, if we say plants, if we say water 
and covers, um, you know, governs 95% of the Earth's heat dynamics. A lot of that is evaporation because evaporation has a cooling effect. And then precipitation. Plants actually cause precipitation. Plants aren't the passive beneficiaries of precipitation. Plants cause precipitation, especially forests cause precipitation. Intact forests cause precipitation. Infiltration is simply soaking into the ground. Now this we're talking we're talking about, we're talking about restoring water cycles. So all this transpiration, evaporation, precipitation, infiltration, it's how we restore water cycles. And the last one on here that I can't quite see is green growth. So if there's enough water soaking into the ground, then that helps the plants grow. That's green growth. Now, so conversely, let's say if we re reversed all these things, the less plants we have, the less transpiration there's going to be. The less transpiration there is, the less evaporation there's going to be. The less plants we have, the less pre precipitation there's going to be. The less plants we have, the less infiltration there's going to be because plants help infiltrate water into the ground. They also grow healthy soils and healthy soils are capable of infiltrating or soaking water into the ground and then green growth if you have plant if you have some green growth it helps more green growth so 3b i'm coming i'm, I'm not too far from the end of this another couple, few slides and we'll be at the end we'll be able to to, to have a discussion so okay somebody else hey my man Lionel wants in so uh, water governs 95% of the Earth's heat dynamics via these processes. Um, Lionel, if you're just joining us, we just covered this slide uh, that said, that said, you know, water governs 95% of the Earth's heat dynamics via these processes, transpiration, evaporation, precipitation, infiltration, and green growth. And the next slide is just a little bit more detail on that. So evaporation is where if you walk into a woods or anywhere there's green plants then there's going to be more evaporation. It feels cool, but it's because it's taking that sensible heat and turning it into latent heat. Latent heat is not really heat. It doesn't feel like heat. It's just another form of energy. It's like motion. It's like all these water molecules are traveling real fast. But it doesn't feel hot. So that's latent heat. Transpiration, plants do this. Plants take that water from the ground and then send it out through their, mainly through their leaves. So we need more plants. If we're going to have transpiration, plants do this. And precipitation, bacteria do this. Plants not only give off water, plants give off bacteria. This bacteria helps the, all these water molecules are floating around. They don't form a raindrop all by themselves. They need a nucleus and that nucleus can be a salt, an ice crystal or a bacteria. Mainly most, most rain that occurs on the land occurs because of this bacteria that comes from plants, mainly from forests, and mainly from intact forests. That's why it's crazy. It is crazy that we're getting rid of our forests. It's crazy. And you don't, you don't hear about this. You don't hear about deforestation being a cause of drought, and yet it is a major cause of drought. Infiltration, good soil does this. Infiltration is where water, rainwater especially soaks into the ground instead of running <laughs> off. When, water, when rain falls, it can go three directions. It can go up, it can go down, or it can go sideways. Up is evaporation, down is infiltration, sideways is runoff. Runoff is the worst. If it evaporates, that might be okay, but it's best if it infiltrates into the ground. It's best if it soaks into the ground, because why? Because if you get to do that, then you've got green growth got wet, moist, soil, living soils, you got good quality soils, 
than the rain. It captures the rain, it holds the rain like a sponge, and from that you get green growth. You can go much longer in between rainfalls. If you have quality soils that soak up the water and cause green growth in between your rainfalls, it's not just how much rain you get, it's how much you keep. So now the next slide is kind of like, it was gonna be understand the value of forests. Okay, that would have been okay. But it's not just forests, it's diverse plant plantings, whether you're talking about farms, forests, or landscapes. It's a diversity of plants, especially native plants, that provides the foundation for a healthy ecosystem. So that diversity is important. It's not just trees are great, but it's not just about trees. So understand the value of ballot biologically diverse plant matter where you all the things we've been talking about evaporation and transpiration precipitation and infiltration plant matter does this and then soils do their part too but you're going to have good soil if you have good plant matter and there's other things you can do for good soil but plant matter is one of the main ones so but also well, this is what i wanted you to see plants are a plants and good soil. it's a reservoir for water Conversely, if we deforest or if we mow too much, we're removing our reservoir of water. There's so much water that is there if we don't deforest and if we don't excessively mow and cut or poison the plants. But, you know, so we need to preserve that reservoir of water. And it's also, guess what? Hey, carbon. It's a reservoir for carbon. Plants are a reservoir for carbon. Quality soil is a reservoir for carbon. And carbon and water flow together. The more carbon you have in your soil, the more it's going to soak up water. So we need to talk about this. This is, you know, getting to holistic solutions. You know, we're not just going to talk about CO2 like it's waste. We're not going to treat water like it's waste. It's a resource. So, number five, understand the value of healthy living soils. This is about soil. Healthy living soils absorb water. Healthy, healthy living, living soils absorb water. Uh, they promote green growth. There is better nutrition if you have healthy living soils. And they're good for wildlife. So if we understand all the benefits of good, healthy, living soils, then we're going to be more likely to do what we can to nurture healthy, living soils. And we'd be more likely to be horrified when people do things that are bad for soils like deforestation, like removing the plant matter, like too much herbicides, insecticides, any of the biocides. Tillage is an assault on soils. We should be horrified when we see tillage because we know that that's destroying the good soil. And the good soil is a resource that absorbs water, promotes green growth, better nutrition, good for wildlife, and reduces erosion. And you can't quite see it here, but reduces erosion and it reduces uh, pollution. So those are all the things that good soils do. So the two main calls to action in this particular talk are nurture green growth and nurture good living soils because those absorb water and provide all the benefits that we get from that. And then, so we've talked mainly about We've talked mainly about um, plant matter and soils in the future. We'll talk about designing for hydration, avoiding toxins, and nurturing whole entire ecosystems. Realize that when we're dealing with plants, it's a whole ecosystem that we're going for. That's why it's terrible. That's why clear-cutting forests is terrible. 
That's why excessive mowing is bad because you're just assaulting the ecosystem time after time after time. A lot of times for no good reason because uh, that's how my parents did it. It's how my grandparents did it. You know, that kind of thing. We need to nurture the entire ecosystem. And conclusion, water governs 95% of the heat dynamics on earth. Water is the quickest, safest way to cool the climate. We didn't really get into that part but we will at some point talk about why it's the quickest, safest way to cool the climate and why merely reducing carbon dioxide is, is we're, we're talking about centuries, decades at minimum, reducing CO2 emissions. It's going to take orders of magnitude longer to do it that way than to cool. We want to actually cool the climate. We do want to reduce CO2 for lots of reasons. We want to reduce fossil fuels for lots of reasons, but it's not going to be quick enough to cool the climate, either the global climate or the micro level climates. So number three, our climate conversation must include water cycles, and it's not. <laughs> Nobody's talking about this. Um, I, it was fairly recently that I got clued in on this, thanks to my friend Judith Schwartz, who wrote a book that I'm going to re recommend to you. Right? She wrote three books, but I'm going to recommend these resources. A Water in Plain Sight by Judith D. Schwartz. Now, Judith has written three books. One is about soil. One is about water. One is about ecosystems. They're all well worth reading. This is the second of the three that focuses on water. So I'm going to recommend that. I'm also going to recommend Water for Any Farm by Mark Shepard. He really gets into some, the earthworks, the key line system, how to capture rainfall using swales, something called a yeoman's plow. But it's all very readable. <laughs> it's technical and it's readable. That's why I recommend it. Uh, there's also other good stuff like Rainwater Harvesting by Brad Lancaster, but I haven't, I, I know it's excellent. I just haven't read very much of it. There's three different volumes of Rainwater Harvesting by Brad Lancaster. There's also Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown, which is excellent. It's hard to pick from among these, but so uh, this has been Water and Climate, why the conversation, why the climate conversation must include water and written by me. Somebody else wants in, and um, and thank you. And we, I'll click out of the presentation, and we'll have a little conversation. How's everybody? So tell me where you're from. Lucy, you're from Maine, USA. Yeah, yeah, Bar Harbor. All these things are fairly familiar to me because I, I've helped put on, um, well, through Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, I've helped put on conferences over a period of years. So I'm familiar with most of the people and I'm just, um, was happy to see your group online. So hopefully it will spread the conversation further. Sure. I guess my big question is how do, it seems this needs to be addressed on more of a national level or lo local level. So how do you get communities to take it on as a policy about how you do even within neighborhoods, how you how do you make that um, the way you do things in case, instead of the way we've been doing it for the last you know fifty years or so? Yeah, exactly. Well, I think it varies. Like uh, it, it's very dependent upon. Like there's some prevailing themes, but it's also dependent on where you are, and it's uh, it's about you know, doing good land management, acre by acre, square mile by square mile, hectare by hectare. And, um, you know, it starts where you live. Uh, it starts with your neighbors. I'm president of the local native plant society, Wild Ones. And um, 
it's just it's just about trying to establish you're trying to grow plant matter and establish good ecosystems, uh, doing good gardening instead of bad gardening. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure what else to say. One of the things that I really like about this content, this subject matter, this agenda, is that it's empowering in that it starts where you are. You know, do the best job with the land that you have where you are. And um, so there's always something to do close by at the, you know, on one's own property. I'm trying to, I'm, I live in urban Louisville and I'm thinking about acquiring a, a couple of vacant lots just to have more of a place to grow a food forest, pollinator garden, that kind of thing. So, you know, as you go, as I go around, I mean, I, I um, there's this uh, friend of mine, well, my native plant group, plus there's this guy named Jody Dahmer who does great work. And he's, he, he and I and our native plant group are just trying to uh, deal with the weed ordinance so that you don't have to mow so much. And, you know, plant native plants, uh, try not to mow so much. I like letting trees grow. I mean, why buy a tree at a nursery when you can, you know, <laughs> hey, there's a maple tree. I'll put a cage around it or bricks around it or a stake by it so I'll know it's there. I've got maples, catalpas, oaks, what else? Uh, uh, hackberry. Well, those are all good native trees. Just They're just volunteering and that's a healthy tree. So uh, anyway. So I'm, I'm yammering, but I mean, the prevailing themes to me, I mean, like what are the main tools for rainwater harvesting? Because a lot of, you know, water and cloud, how do you get it started? Well, rainwater harvesting and rainwater harvesting is a function of plant matter, letting your plant matter grow, weeding it selectively so that you have a good mix of mainly native plants, you know, non-natives can be okay, but you know, you, you weed according to what, so plant matter, soil health, minor earthworks like swales and small ponds to capture water, see your water as a resource, not as a, not as waste. And um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of my, you know, it means a pretty, you know, really, truly, it's a largely agricultural state. So it, it's sort of trying to get everybody to get on board to take more in neighborhoods mm -hmm. to make the information or, or the more prevailing policy to get people to do what is more. But, the, you know, things are changing and I've noticed a big change just in my own neighborhood in, in terms of the monarchs this summer. Mm. So, it's, so that's encouraging. Yeah, tell me about that. So you're planting milkweed and other other um, types yeah, of wildflowers um, like milkweed, asters. Um, Joe pie weed, mm -hmm. um, asters, coneflowers, um, coreopsis. I mean, and I the first year I did it, I, I had monarchs the first year. Hmm. So I now I have you know I have. Well, I mean, I obviously don't know if it's the same pairs, but I have pairs that come back every year in, in my backyard for the last three years. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the post about the number, the increase in monarchs out on California, the on Bismo, Pismo Bay, I think. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, there, it's something like a 3,500% increase in the number of monarchs this, this year. Wow. That's phenomenal. It's a big and increase. I noticed it just in my own, in my neighborhood. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think just people, it's people are more aware and they're wanting to plant that way. So right. anyway, I, <laughs> the last few years I've, no, I've noticed quite a big change. Butterflies are important. Bees, butterflies, and birds are great indicators of whether you're doing things right. It's good that people are aware of monarch butterflies. And when you plant, you know, when you plant milkweeds, there are other 
uh, insects and bees that can drink the nectar from the milkweeds. And then people that get into milkweed, they get into the other wildflowers that you named, like your coneflower and your coleopsis and, and uh, your asters. And there's just more awareness. And it's all good because I, I like saying that it's not just plants that harvest water and conserve water and absorb carbon. It's entire ecosystems, which includes plants, animals, fungi, bacteria. It's the, it's the ecosystem operating as a whole that is going to absorb the water, conserve the water. And, uh, and, and, it, and when people understand what butterflies need, then that's a substantial step forward toward understanding what the entire ecosystem needs. Well, it's looking hopeful here then. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Rob, how's it going? Yeah, look, I, I didn't want to um, take over the thing, but um, it's just so fundamental. Um, I, I've sort of noticed cycling, like water cycle, nutrient cycle, and they're all intertied. And I, I 80 acres here in Australia. And, uh, you know, burn the wood, neat, but it's all about cycling. And when you say birds and animals, it, I didn't realize the soil food we, was also birds and bigger things. It's all intertwined. So if you see more birds or insects, there's obviously more going on in your soil. And I'm seeing that every day or every year progress in my garden. Or, you know, blue banded bees are coming and the monarchs we, we've had for a while, but more are coming, uh, more lizards, more. Um, it's just, it, it just all makes sense. Um, and um, I, nature's worked this out over billions of years and all we've got to do is let it happen. And, um, but my, my concern is heart is since air conditioning came in, I was only thinking a couple of weeks ago, the like my parents, we had a nice big garden, the neighbors, bought, you know, this big concrete bunker. The, the, in Australia, it's more about more indoor living in the big family rooms, but with air conditioning, you dis you don't need a garden to cool. So we've disconnected from our gardens. Um, I think that's a big thing. And I remember as a kid, my uncle had air conditioning and oh, this is great. But I went outside and innocently as a child, gee, this heat, where's this is all, where's all this going? And innocently as a kid, I thought, well, all this heat's coming outside, making it hotter. And <laughs> I, I think that's going to blow on effect. Um, you know, I think air conditioning has disconnected us from mm -hmm. appreciating a tree because I remember coming home from school before air, as, as mm. a kid, you mm -hmm. sit under a tree, but now you're in a car or you're, um, so not so much the emission, well, it is the emissions, but the heat, but mm -hmm. we, we're disconnecting. Um, the other thing is getting things going, Lucy, was, you know, I, there's a garden I know in a pretty arid environment and he's, he's an old Italian so gardener and he, he just builds up his soil and he's and he's using perennial plants and he's inspiring me and it's just I've sometimes put some spurl of his garden on water and climate because I think although someone's just a compost it's all part of the bigger picture like um you know I know a local biochar person um I think the wheel's already been reinvented but a lot of us by nature think we've got to reinvent the wheel but what I like about Hartsing is he's collecting all the the people with all around the world with resources. And um, I, I think, you know, it's all out there. We've got the knowledge out there. Um, you know, I think I couldn't believe Alan Savory was on this group, the legend mm. himself, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. you, know, <laughs> but you, you know, to think that, you know, we're, it's all, we're all one big, when you build a house, you think about it, you have a plumber, you have a con, you have a, it's not just a builder. It's a, and, and same with ecosystems in your garden, you have all different levels and um, somebody say, oh, is this good for compost and coffee grounds? I said, yes, but biodiversity is king. Get as much as, as you can. You know, if you've got something local resource in abundance, whatever, by all means use that, but more biodiversity, the better, um, which I, I found, but um, I don't know much else to say, but... Uh, um, I've been in my garden 18 years. I've totally changed the way I look at it because I had to, because nothing would grow. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just building the soil, basically. 
Um, and conventionally, I used to think that soil water um, collecting or collection of water reservoirs was dams and tanks and all that. Now it's soil. I'm sort of more lean. It's there's a massive amount of soil and plants, and I can see we had 75 mil of rain flooded out, and it was soaking into my built up soil and running off the the uncovered soil, if that makes sense. So I just see it black and white at my place. Um, but probably enough for me, but I don't know what else to say. I just think it's so logical um, cycles. and 75 mil, water. that's 7.5 centimetres. That's a lot of rain. So for Australia, see. and that was in one, one or two hours, so I couldn't get home. But um, the next day it was still raining, and I, I see where it's bare run off. And as I'm building the soil, it's running in. And our place has definitely got cooler because we're in a rain shadow, sort of a semi-arid climate. And um, I've really enjoyed trying to get things to grow. If it was easy, <laughs> it wouldn't be a challenge. But right. so, I mean, this is what I've got just fascinated by the soil food web. I um, love to get a microscope. And, but um, I think every, you know, composters, worm farmers, we're, let's lean on, off each other and... Um, I know California, that's, you know, there's a scientists are interested in um, in helping California. And, you know, if you can rehydrate that, you can do anywhere. Jeff Lawton did a self-sustaining garden in the Jordan. And mm -hmm. then he found that when he got the fungi and it made the salt inert, which stumped scientists. And you've probably seen it. it's just mind boggling. And we've got all the knowledge there. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, probably so, enough for me. No, here's, here's what comes to mind for me. How did we get to a place where we feel like we can grow anything with dead soil? Because that's what agriculture is today. And a lot of gardening is not too far from that. We, we think we can grow stuff in, in, in dead soil. How did we get to that place? Sorry, how did we what, sorry? How did we... how did we get to the place where we feel like we can grow stuff in dead soil? I mean, maybe it's not oh. a great question. It's like, but once you understand that soil is a living ecosystem and it has these functions that work unless you destroy those functions with tilling, with fertilizers, with biocides and things like that that kill the life of the soil. So... Well, we've got away with it part with drugging the soil with artificial fertilizers, which is artificial, and then we're having um, other consequences that we're now realizing. Um, and I used to think soil was just dirt. I didn't realize it was actually a living being, um, if that makes sense. It, you know, you can smell it, you can feel it, you can. You know, I love watering the garden hot. You feel the energy coming off it, and I think the water vapor. Um, is really critical, um, but I think we've been drugging the soil with artificial and killing the biology and um, noticing the soil depletes. And um, yeah, one thing I've noticed, noticed, you know, in the last year and a half or so, I've been reporting on climate since mid 2018, and. Uh, Somewhere toward the middle or end of 2019, I started to notice how much of this conversation seems to be dominated by commercial interests. It's like if they can sell you fertilizer, they're going to do that. If they can sell you insecticide, if they're, they're going to do that. If they can sell you solar panels, they're going to do that. And there might be a place in the world for all of those things, maybe, but the commercial interest tends to drive the conversation. Oh, as absolutely. opposed to, as opposed to, go ahead, Lucy. Well, I'm just curious and, and when, you, when you're thinking about things, I mean, I think we're, you're right, I mean, we haven't had enough conversation about what we can do about draw drawdown and the potential. Available. I mean, well, first of all, it's not widely. I, I mean, I don't think it's part of our educational system to do much. So that that's one thing. Um, but 
I mean, do you think we could proceed as we are, but take on a, um, a policy of, you know, intense, um, well, like a, a, a different approach to our soils and, um, and basically restoration of our ecosystems and, and I won't say totally solve the climate crisis because I've been, but at least, you know, partially solve it through drawdown. If our soils were healthy, if our mm -hmm. policies were enough that encouraged this kind of um, activity. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm being clear, but mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to solve without this? Because, you know, now it's all there is, is there's talk and it seems yeah. to be a lot of talk of, of transitioning to another energy system. I, I don't know how familiar you are or if you've listened in with the, the Post Carbon Institute. Hmm. Um, but I mean, they, they've done, been, uh, uh, just because I've done a lot, I've listened to a lot of programs and there's a, one man who's just saying that the amount of, the problem is the amount of carbon and energy we're gonna put into the atmosphere making this transition, it's just making the problem worse. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's that. I mean, right. And, you know, to me, it's about holistic solutions. And, you know, holistic management is not just a, a formula. It's a, a process. It, it is kind of a formula, but we don't need to be... Um, what we do need to do is, I'm a big believer in actual democracy, which we've never seen. Uh, we, we, need to, we need for people, actual democracy is where you get to vote on what affects you. There's a lot of stuff that happens that affects us, but we don't get to say how that's going to go. You know, imagine living in a poor neighborhood and having absolute veto power over a toxic plant locating in that neighborhood. That would be democracy. That would be when you get to vote on what affects you. Imagine if we, the people, got to decide what kind of transportation system we're going to have, what kind of agricultural system we're going to have. And that's, you know, we don't do that because as between democracy and money, money has almost all the power. Even if you think democracy has some power here, even though it's imperfect, you still have to admit that, wow, money has a whole lot of power and money probably has a little more power than democracy. There's even an argument. So, so I'm, I'm just saying we can only expect so much at the, especially at the federal level and at the state level to a large extent at the local level, we can only expect so much if this is fundamentally not a democratic process. So there, so there's that, and um, you know we need a democratic process, and it, and we need to be uh, have holistic management as opposed to just cherry picking things like and like CO two is part of the problem, but it's a relatively it's a it's a something to focus on. And fossil fuels are something to focus on that really distracts us from a bigger, more holistic picture. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see more, dem more democracy and more holistic decision making. And we don't have, right now, we don't have either one of those at the level of government. So I think that's the problem to solve. And, and without that, I'm not sure what can be expected at the, at the level of government. Well, I mean, well, I just think that, I think there are gonna be certain things that almost that are forced. I think the climate, I mean, just from my observations of what's happening are gonna, are gonna force some things upon us rather rapidly. I mean, mm -hmm. don't you think, I mean, I mean, because it's already happening. So, so we need broad scale education that, you know, this is what we can do to 
alleviate the the impacts of flooding and the and um, because otherwise it's going to climate change is going to take up you know it's going to be a catastrophe right <laughs> I mean and I don't know how you get beyond I mean I haven't um, you know I've sort of been involved in any number of groups but how how do you get to the next level? I mean, yes to democracy. I don't know if you followed um, Heather Cox Richardson. I mean, there are many people who think we're on the brink of no longer becoming a democracy. That we're really on the edge, almost like the climate. There is a democracy and climate. I mean, they're sort of together and then we're sort of on the edge of losing our democracy. We're sort of getting on the edge of losing control of our cli the climate situation. I think they go, I think they go hand in hand. But anyway, yeah, well, I mean, I, I hear everything you're saying. I'm just I'm not wanting to butt in and be a know it all. Um, but I hear everything you're saying, and it's it's hard to predict how things are going to go. I mean, Heather Cox Richardson is in the is in the center. Un unfortunately, I just I think she's, you know, she's bought into this level of militarism that I don't think is going to ever work. I mean, I, I read something from her. She's just, she's a centrist who thinks the problem is the right. And the only reason the right is a problem is because the center is not the center. They're also lean heavily. The, you know, the, the, you know I, I just don't think liberals and Democrats have delivered anything of interest or of value to people. Medicare for all. I mean, okay. So I'm gonna get into some social issues, and social that social issues are part of climate because you have to treat people fairly if you want their participation. Right. Yeah. I agree. And and, and uh, things like Medicare for all. I'm in favor of a universal basic income, universal basic income, Medicare for all, living wage, stronger unions. Uh, these are all things that would free people up to not be so desperate and moving from crisis to crisis all the time. Medicare for all would free people up from that which ties them to companies that they might not want to work for, they might want to move around. A, a, a stronger wage would keep people from having to be desperate and work two or three jobs. And, and I just think ethically you have to, People in America and people overseas, um, people in other countries, you have to treat people fairly and ethically. Otherwise, I don't have any, any reason to believe that we, that we can or should solve the climate crisis if we're being so heartless and cruel to our own people and people elsewhere. And I think that is a problem that the Democratic Party could solve in a heartbeat if they chose to, but they don't choose to. They don't, they're, they have, you, you've got Democrats in, in charge of the White House, both houses of Congress. 90% of Democrats want Medicare for all. And, and this party can't be bothered to even make it an issue. And I think Heather Cox Richardson does not see that. She doesn't see the opportunity to reach out and give people something that's going to make a difference in their lives, nor does she see the problem with militarism and surveillance. And you know, a police state is not going to solve the climate crisis. They might act like they will, but a, a police state is not going to solve the climate crisis. What? Well, anyway. I, I didn't mean to get in. No, feel free. I, I mean, I, you know, I opened up that can of worms. So feel free. I, I'm not going to be unkind or anything. Feel free to. Oh, no, you know, and either, back no, on. No, either am I. I'm just saying it. So how do we, it's sort of like we have this information sort of, it, it's all there. And how do we truly get it moving in a, in, in a way that's going to be constructive? I mean, I, you know, I do. I do see it, I have measures of hope. I mean, I've just seen it in the last, well, you know, as I said, the number of monarchs in, in a short mm -hmm. period of time. So people are becoming more aware, but I guess it's like as a policy, how do you get it to be like 
look folks, this is what we have to do and we can greatly improve our chances of overcoming. Well, let me share with you something that I, I was thinking about saying a little while ago. And that is, I'm gonna share with you something that I think and feel and I, I, I uh, this material, I, I got to know, I, I'm here <laughs> because, <laughs> because of Judith Schwartz. And her book, Cows Save the Planet, has this chapter four, it's water, the return of lost water. And that introduced me to the new water paradigm. And people like Michael Kravchik and Mian Mian. Right. And, yeah. and this, this and, and what, what I think, what Judith thinks, what Mian Mian thinks is that, you know, this content is empowering precisely because you have no choice. Well, I mean, you can at least do it where you are. You know, you can at least do that. Right. And you can at least do it in your community. And there's a, there's a line of reasoning that says, it's like, who was it? Albert Schweitzer that said, um, that said being an example is not the best way to teach. It's the only way. There's an extent to which humans won't hear what you say nearly so much as they see what you do and uh, hey i want to do that i want to participate in that so because we know the importance of ecosystems and water cycles in curing our planet curing the climate crisis and because we know biodiversity is so important and biodiversity cannot be separated from climate and it shouldn't be separated from climate and biodiversity begins where we are soil health begins where we are um, water cycles begin where we are. Rainwater harvesting, by definition, happens when you harvest the rain that falls on your property. And it's something that, you know, it would be great if we could have policies and educational programs that would spread this, spread the word and make this happen on a large scale. That would be great. And I think, you know, people, the permaculture world has been doing this for 50 years. I mean, Jeff Lawton, <laughs> I don't care if he ever heard of the new water paradigm, he lives it. So Jeff Lawton and Michael Kravchik and Alan Savory, they are doing this work irrespective of the terminology. And um, so, so, that's, that, so that's one reason I really like this material and this work and that is as opposed to if you want to deal with co2 you're one of 7.5 billion people and you have to change policy at the federal and even the international level there, there are three big three three big sectors in my mind that are obviously 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 need reform if you're going to make a difference in CO2, irrespective of, forget renewable energy. You're, mm -hmm. you're never going to have a clean and renewable bomb. You're never going to have a clean and renewable superhighway. And you're, what's the third? You're never going to have a clean and renewable genetically modified corn crop. <laughs> so defense, transportation, and industrial agriculture are, are those to me, those three main sectors that that need to be uh, reformed, and I'm I I love talking about peace and things like that, and but I, I just feel that I have so little impact on the military, on the war machine, and all that. I feel like I have so little opportunity to influence the transportation sector, even though it's, it's obvious what needs to be done. You need to stop letting oil companies and car companies, uh, uh, oil companies, auto companies, and there's a, and there's a third one that I, I forget, but oil companies and auto companies run the show. They prevent policies that would be, that they prevent policies that people want. People want more mass transit. People want functioning multimodal transportation. People want that stuff. I mean, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, the oil companies and the auto companies were buying train cars and smashing them and tearing up railroad tracks because that was their competition. 
they got like a $5,000 fine for all that. that's cost of doing business. That was pocket change. And they're still doing that stuff. Um, I saw an, an Exxon executive the other day being interviewed and he said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about wanting a carbon tax, but then we're going to go to our legislator and say, you don't want a carbon tax and they need us like they, the legislature need us Exxon to fund their campaigns. So, so, so there's that, you know, so what, so what needs to be done and what is happening, two different things. It's so hard to, to, to make change at that level. So I'm going to keep talking about it, <laughs> but, uh, but there's, it, it's great to be able to do something that is so it's beautiful. It's visceral. It's, communal <laughs> it's something the community can do together and it's something they have never heard about even if they're gardeners even if they're what they they're they're hikers even if they're climate activists they have never heard how important water is how quickly water could cool a, cool, cool so I live, how quickly water could cool the local climate and the global climate I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. We have the fastest growing urban heat island in the country. The urban heat island is defined by the difference on a summer night, especially the difference the, between the nighttime temperatures between the urban area and further out in the country. Fastest growing urban heat, uh, the fastest growing difference between urban and countryside. And so urban heat island means something to me. And we can do something about it. We can create our own little microclimate on a eighth of an acre. We can do that. And if we have more than that, we can do that. And, uh, and it's a chance to get involved in doing something that's exciting. It's visceral. Everybody loves a shade tree. Everybody loves bees, butterflies, and birds. So, Lionel, how you doing, man? Lionel's here from Mexico City. Steve, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Listen, listen carefully to all that you have done. You all have said. Uh, you're talking about revolution. <laughs> <you're> talking about? <laughs> hey, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. No, but it's, it's, it's a real revolution. And you know, the National it's, Security it's, Agency is recording this entire conversation. <laughs> so when you say that word, then they're, all their dingers go off. All their blue lights light up. Okay, <laughs> there's a revolutionary in Louisville, Kentucky. we got to follow him now. <laughs> well, uh, all right, man. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Or what you have said about um, the political system, but um, Lucy just mentioned education and you, 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 you did it as well. And um, there's some um, kind of um, a momentum. This kind of group wasn't uh, even thinkable about five years, 10 years ago. And now you have more than 1000 people listening and writing and participate in this kind of movement. And this is like a small island, but there are many, 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 many islands like this uh, growing. And we are starting to, como se dice, coalescer, coalescence? Hmm? Qual qualquer or whatever. It's a, it's a, we're, we're growing and we're going to, we're starting to find the other the other, the other island is growing as well. Right. It's going to take a generation. It's mm. going to take at least a generation. Mm. We don't have a generation to fix a problem. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> if we only had a generation, that would be just great. <laughs> well, it, it could be. Yeah, I'm sure that you're familiar with the draw, draw down a project mm -hmm. and Paul things Hawken. like that. Yeah. Uh, Paul Hawken, yeah. And I'm, I'm really aware about them. Um, all this uh, water, more than 50% of population right now lives in cities. 
And in cities, the the water problem. It's uh, I would love to to talk with you widely and openly and <laughs> about this. And I'm in since two years ago trying to find a way to recycle the whole uh, water system in, in every every house. <clears throat> Human beings uh, have um, this, um, in, how do you call it, from its kidneys, <laughs> and we're very efficient in the in the management of our water. Hmm? But right now, uh, societies are just, just uh, wasteful. We get the water, whatever we can, and we just slightly use it, we pollute it, and we give it away. Mm -hmm. we, we get rid of this as fast as possible. And <clears throat> with 50% of the population now living in the cities, we need to fix the cities and the water system in the cities. And it's not the big um, hydrocracy <laughs> with a lot of civil engineer around that. It's it's it has to be something that we can we could as if we could make a, a kidney for a, every home, we could recirculate around ninety percent of the of the water. I've been talking with engineers. I've been talking about with sociologists uh, about this kind of things, and most of the people think I'm not, and I'm really not. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> But I think we, we Most have people to say do a that. lot. Uh, they're crazy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's what I thought you said. <clears throat> but we have to fix the, the, the urban part of the, of the water cycle. Mm? And we have to fix it soon. Mm? And <clears throat> we'll talk about that later and things like that. But I agree with you. And what I could say to, to finish my... This time, it's that you're doing a great, great job when you just put it not just carbon. It's water and carbon, the main, the main uh, matter that we have to fix. And you see, you started with a few people around there, and you have more than one thousand already. And we're we're starting to to how do you say to Ah, sorry about my English. Mm. To share, Spanish. <laughs> no, to share to share all the all all this knowledge that you're putting. Uh, sometimes I, I put your your stuff in in twenty more groups with mm. Mexican uh, researchers, with uh, water uh, people all over the world, with um, local farmers, with. Uh, mm, so you're doing an amazing job, you all, mm -hmm. and we have to just we have to be patient, mm -hmm. and right. we don't we cannot afford to be patient. <laughs> and thanks <laughs> a lot. <for> that. <laughs> right. Well, thank you for your kind words, and I'm tempted to fly down to Mexico City because I speak I know just enough Spanish to be dangerous, and uh, and uh, I'd like to see what you got going down there. You're welcome anytime, huh? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Steve, you had a question or a, you wanted to talk, wanted to say something. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me there? Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, great conversation. Thanks. And, and great advocacy in this group for water. Um, I'm also a big fan of the new water paradigm and um, the change that's possible is, is pretty mind blowing mm -hmm. when you understand that climatology 101 that Walter Yaney sort of lays out and all the others. Um, I was thinking before and just wanted to make a comment on how far, um, how far a mindset shift it needs to be. There's, there's a, um, the emergency firefighters in Australia, a lot of the commissioners have got together, about 30 of them from all the different states, and they've formed a, a climate action plan. They're, they've detailed all their different things. You know, we need more firefighters, we need carbon drawdown, et cetera, et cetera. 
and stress the urgency, but there's, there's no mention of water rehydrating landscapes. Um, if we do nothing about it, Australia is going to continue to, to desertify with our land management. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens that bushfires even bigger than the ones we've got, which is very scary, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there's very bright people, um, uh, Tim Flannery and others that, that haven't really engaged that um, water aspect. Um, so yeah, they're just a few thoughts on, I, I think I think the change is happening. I think, that, I think there's a lot of momentum. And um, yeah, hopefully the, the upcoming talks, the upcoming climate talks will um, further educate people and they can shift shift their ideas. It's pretty hard to let go of old ideas, but um, hopefully that'll change a bit with some research and papers. What would you like to see happen, Steve? Um, for me, the, the main thing is um, cooling landscapes. So it's um, strategically looking at how we manage our landscapes and just getting rain inland as far as possible, changing our small water cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's the, that's what Walter and, um, and other, others are looking at, that if we do that, we can change the interior of our countries. And, um, one, um, example that Walter gave was when Australia was cooler in land, the, the monsoon could come right down. We did that, didn't have that, um, high pressure heat dome effect. And we had, um, tropical forests and, um, 25 meter freshwater lakes in the middle of Australia mm. because it was a lot cooler. So we need to manage our landscapes for cool, um, soak water into the ground. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking at it from an agricultural broader land management. I think the urban stuff is, is good. Um, all these small aspects, you know, um, every little bit people can do, but I, my, um, the bit I'm optimistic about is sort of getting those corridors inland to change the, the small water cycle moving in. Yeah. So in your mind, what are the main tools for changing the small water cycle? Um, certainly vegetation. Um, trying to get more moisture in vegetation for Australia so we can get fungi to break down the fuel load instead of burning every year. Um, the, the property I'm on gets burnt every couple of years and just the heat, you notice that you get severe storms, um, mm -hmm. wilder storms just from that, um, you get more extreme weather instead of more oh. mod moderated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Australia's been getting, um, plenty of, um, tornadoes and hail storms this year. Um, so hopefully um, people like insurance companies and whatever with, with this learning of the new paradigm that you can influence the weather by your land management. You can draw rain in, change a small water cycle. Hopefully there'll be benefits for them because uh, things like house insurance are unaffordable in places where there's um, bushfire prone areas. Um, mm. Yeah. So a lot of change needs to happen. I think there's only, Thousands of people aware of this paradigm at the moment, in my view. So a couple of follow-up questions. One is, I think it's interesting that you're thinking about working with insurance companies. That's an interesting angle I'd like to hear more about. And also, you know, I understand, like, I understand why people burn. So what can we do to change the water cycle so that they would see less of a need to burn? Don't you have to substitute the burning with some kind of grazing animal or something? Yeah, yep, grazing animal. Um, um, and just reducing your, um, you know, to, um, fire ladders on trees, taking off the lower limbs on trees. So it's not just climbing up the tree and burning. So you've got bigger trees, you've got more shade, um, more moisture in the ground. You don't have bare earth. And uh, probably also um, with improved fertility, you get um, better pasture species. Um, and then better pasture species when you're moving your cattle around or livestock, 
um, they're also watering and manuring all over the place. So okay. it's, it's an upward regenerative cycle. Um, so do you have a method for, I know rotational grazing might not be the best term, but do you have a, a, a methods for holistic management, um, that kind of thing? Do you, how do you know? How do you know how to change the paddock that the animals are grazing in? Yep, um, I, I've got a handful of cattle. I don't do um, holistic management at this stage for a few different reasons, just mostly um, social and family reasons. And that sort of um, yeah, there's different methods. There's some people are into total grazing, which take it right down. Other people are into leave it, leave a third, um, keep a third for litter um that sort of thing mm -hmm. um yeah but anything is better than bare ground really right. Um, right. i've noticed in our um, paddocks at the moment um just uh, a, a lot, we moved the cattle and there's a lot of dry dead stuff and, and we were like oh we really need the cattle in here just getting that little bit of brown in and renewing the fresh growth otherwise it just oxidizes and doesn't do any good when it's ending up the fungi can't break it down it needs to be on the ground with that moisture do you have a waterway that flows through your property uh, a couple of dams um, part i'm on is part of a bigger, bigger um, yeah there's there's also another um sort of feature i'm exploring and trying to get some help with at the moment um an idea called maximum infiltration which i've posted some videos around the place um so that's using um uh, fuelless water pumps a bunyip pump to release water slowly into a swale and um release it over time so you can infiltrate and then you have storms and things that go into a swale and then they sort of recharge you can soak in a lot of water so how do the water pumps work? Did you say they're solar? Um, gravity. Gravity. It's a, a, a perpetual powered piston pump. So it's got 55 to 60% efficiency up to that. So it's, it's a lot more efficient than a ram pump. Um, so you're feeding the, the pump from a pond that's at a higher elevation? That's right. Yeah, there's an animation um, that I've recently put out around the place. Um, so that's, that's one. Um, focus of mine at the moment sort of sharing that idea and in the hope that it can be scaled you know to massive watersheds or smaller um and yeah there's interest you know Walter Yaney and, and a handful of other people are keen on the idea so um yeah hopefully that'll develop further um, so do you, do you live in the on the eastern part of the continent I am yep yeah yeah up north we got um intense wet seasons and long dry seasons, about mm -hmm. seven months dry season. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I can um, share a few videos, um, post them on your Facebook page. Yeah, later please do. Like. that would be great. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you're in, in uh, increasing the infiltration time by a factor of hundreds to thousands of times, what, it, what it's just infiltrating when it's raining, the, um, the idea is pretty exciting that you can soak in a, an entire wet season, even with a basic infiltration rate of just a couple of mil, two mil. Um, yeah, that slow release. Per, and then you can change day? It. A couple of mil per day? Um, per hour. Two mil hour. per hour in, in a heavy clay soil. These pumps have got good capability. They're, um, they can pump to 35 metres, um, 30,000 litres a day. Um, that's, that's about 25% of the water volume that goes through the pump is pumped up, which is relatively high compared to a ram pump. And then, um, and 75% is exhaust water. So you're infiltrating uh, a lot of water because you're doing it, uh, uh, you're using kind of a slow drip. Uh, and that has the effect of making your ground wetter and then how, how do, does that change the ground over the course of time? Does that, does that stimulate the growth of plants and things like that? Yeah, yep, that's right. And it infiltrates um, so much water to the extent that you'd have to look at 
um, how much is too much. And you'd have to stop it periodically to get mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. desirable growing conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where people smarter than myself will figure out the technical aspects. And um, that's what I'm hoping they'll be able to see, you know, potentially there's some soils. So you do that on. during the seven month dry season? Depending on the size of your, um, depending on the size of your catchment, um, your mid-slope dam, um, you could do it all year if you've got a big enough mid-slope dam, or if it's smaller, you can, it, there's different, many different variations. Um, you could do it during the wet season, and then you're calculating your rates so that the next storm or rainfall event fills up the dam because it's going down, and then you're aware of how much water you get per month. You're aware of what goes into the catchment. You're aware of how much the swale can infiltrate. Um, you're doing very well to understand as much as you are without the animation. So well done to you. Oh, thank you. I was going to ask, um, is, is, uh, is there ever a problem with salinization? Not to my uh, knowledge. My, my understanding is fresh water is lighter than salt water. So I think that that, um, is, is that the case? I think I was hearing that recently. That, Let me um, see. Fresh, yeah, I think salt water is heavier than fresh water. Yeah, so that could be a benefit in that, um, yeah, the fresh water going through um, would be um, sort of mitigate that a bit. Also another factor for me, and it might be a more general thing, is that bore water in these heavier clay soils is of poor quality. So you've got all the um, growing issues. It sort of pushes your pH around a bit and uh, all the nutrients aren't available. So if you're able to soak in higher quality water and have that gravity water when you need it, um, that's a big benefit to places that um, in late in the dry season, they're just relying on inferior quality groundwater. So this is a method that you would like to get other people to adopt? Yeah, yep. It's um, I'm throwing the idea out there to as many different people that I think might be interested. And I think it needs some trials around the place and some technical know-how. But I think the idea is simple enough that no one has debated the, the concept yet. They can see that by increasing the infiltration time, you're going to have a lot of water going into the ground. So when I think of traditional row crop irrigation, it's different from this in a couple of different ways. One is in row crop your irrigation, you're sending the water. You, for one thing, you've got you typically tilled ground and you're sending it in between each row, but you're using a swale and your water is, is dripping into that swale and then it spreads out from there. It does, yep. Uh, I wouldn't say dripping, it's, it's coming out yeah, okay. at, a, at a rate of knots really. Um, and the, the distance between the dam and the um, lower swale is, there's, there's also a lower swale as well, is um, six metres is the maximum at this stage. It, this, the pump can operate from 0.4 metres and up to a, a maximum of six metres. And it, it's uh, another pump every. So, how do you get very far if you're just pumping at six meters? So, pick six meters is the gravity fall to get the um, the, okay. the, okay. Pump, the pump to work. work. That's yeah. the maximum fall. Point mm -hmm. four is the minimum you can use it at. Okay. Um, and it, it, the pressure that the pump can withstand is up to four hundred meters elevation, which would be a very minute amount going out. Um, that's three times the potential head pressure of the best pumps on the market in other pumps and, and a lot more efficiency than, um, than a ram pump. Yeah, so that the aspect that I'm interested in and I'm hoping that others um, can see potential in is using it as a, as a way to catch extreme runoff and rainfall to change the small water cycle of an area. And if you're scaling it to a big watershed, you can really push that um push the rain inland in a hurry really yeah so um, how would you uh kind of quantify the effect on the small water cycle would you look at precipitation yeah that's um technical aspects that i'm hoping to inspire a few experts in the field and that's all a long way beyond my pay grade mm -hmm. and um yeah 
hopefully there'll be some trials around the place. Uh, how how wide are your swales? Um, as how wide as you? yeah, as wide as you want. Um, for me, I was modelling on a, on a six percent heavy clay slope. Um, the swales were about seven hundred meters. Um, so there should be some relation from the swale length and your catchment to um, to the output. I think. Do you dig them with some kind of heavy equipment, or yeah, yeah, yeah? It can potentially be done on a small scale with a small pump. They've, they've got about three different sizes in the in the bunyip pump is the name of it. Um, they've had inquiries for, so it sort of uses a tire to go in and out. Um, it inflates and deflates. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to post some links up for you. Sorry, yeah. I can't do it now. But uh, uh, I understand. I had another yeah. question, but then I forgot what it was. Um, yeah. Oh, do you do you plant something in the swale? Yeah, certainly um, on the swale at the back of the swale. Yep, any any vegetation would um, minimize evaporation. Here we are on the property I'm on. We allow for eighteen hundred mil of evaporation sorry whatever that is an imperial uh, you know six foot so it's a lot of water evaporated in a dam by itself with you know no lily pads and cover on it so by getting into the ground you're avoiding that evaporation and you're also getting that um that pumping that for right. later in the year absolutely i mean evaporation can be wicked yeah. <laughs> that's like Absolutely. evaporation makes all of your water go away that's that's not what we wanted to happen <laughs> yeah it is it's part of the small water cycle but um you know if it's going to someone else's place you know right. you'd be nice to have uh, it when you need it you want the evapor you don't want the evaporation to come out of a body of water you want it to come out of the plants because there's a lot more of it i think yep yep to get that cooling yep Plus, when the evaporation yeah. comes out of the plants, it also includes the, the bacteria, which causes the precipitation and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. And, and an evolving space. They don't really know what species have that hydroscopic bacteria, which is... Um, right. Would be great to know, but it, it's not eucalypts anyway. <laughs> yeah. We, 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 we maybe are. someday soon they'll figure that out. Hope so. You know what we're talking uh, about, Lucy? No, I mean don't. parts of parts of it I do. Yeah. Well the 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 um the bacteria is a way of causing rain, trees especially. We we know that trees uh you know emit a bacteria called Arabacter. It was discovered by Louis Pasteur, and there's this Arabacter bacteria that trees emit because that causes precipitation. We what we don't know is which plants emit the Arabacter and in which quantities. That's just something that science has yet to find out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it's just kind of a question mark. It's a crapshoot as to, you know, but I would say it's hard to go wrong, Steve, if you're planting native, you know, plants and trees that are native to your area, of course, not all natives are the same, and I'm in I'm in Kentucky, which is 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 not dry. <laughs> it's not arid. Yep. It's not fragile. It's not um, what's the term? Uh, brittle. Not in the least. But mm -hmm. um, I know that in North America there are about ten or twelve trees that are ecological powerhouses. And it's hard to go wrong if you're planting those trees. Of course, mm -hmm. not just trees, but if you start with like oaks, willows, native willows, plums and cherries, birch, maple, pine, hickory, those are the trees that are really ecological. They, they bring a lot of life if you put them yep. in there. So I think, yep. and I know that, you know, no doubt Australia has its share of non-natives and and that kind of thing. And maybe some of the natives are, maybe you don't want eucalyptus all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and it, but um, yeah, anyway. probably pioneer rainforest species would, would be good for the 
small water cycle rather than the different eucalypts that it loved fire right. and exactly sort of so thing. how did how did walter yenny do that he's got a rainforest somewhere in australia a mm. rainforest built yep. on sand so how did he do that and can you do that and do you want to simulate that kind of thing and does it take a lot of time or a lot of money um yeah a few questions there walter <laughs> yenny <Yeni. laughs> and probably some i can't answer uh my understanding from Walter is he was doing some work on Fraser Island. So it's the biggest sand island in the world, I, I believe. Um, and his comments on that were um, just showing that biology is incredible in, in cycling and creating its own fertility. Mm -hmm. um, in Canberra at the Botanical Gardens, our capital city, he's, he's set up a misting system some decades and decades ago. And um, that comes on regularly and it's, a lot cooler than outside um, on the bare ground and, and eucalypt forest outside. So that's that's quite a desirable setup. And if you had gravity water to play with that you could have a misting system come on and off, that'd be lovely to have a, a rainforest area that could build that humidity and, and have all the different species. You know, you could have subtropical fruit species and mm. tropical and even Mediterranean um, if you can get the conditions right, even though we don't have a Mediterranean climate, we've certainly got plenty of heat and that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's not a Mediterranean climate? No. Um, where I am, a tr tropical, tropical savanna, but I'm also up on a tableland. So we're about 400 metres elevation. Um, further on the tropical tablelands, um, there's it goes up to 700, 800 metres elevation. So they get they get dozens of frosts a year, whereas we might only get a couple every every few years. So there's great diversity here of a lot of different um, fruits and things because you can get the fruit chill hours required. Mm. Um, a lot of different geology, some fantastic soils. I'm on pretty poor soil, um, almost non-existent because of the, the rainfall and the erosion and just wipes it out. Well, if you want a place to explain and 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 pitch your system, thanks, Hart. I'm That'd available be great. for that. I'm available great. for that. that. That that would be fun. To, great. You know, and That's I, fun. I, I can't think of a better thing that I would like to do. Maybe I don't have enough fun, but <laughs> but sounds uh, like me. That'd be great. Thanks, Hart. It, my mm -hmm. I know I don't have the skills and technical know-how to take the idea to the next level. So my strategy is to share it. Well, <laughs> I'm out of my depth. Anything beyond that is, is, um, hey, we're all just muddling our way through this. Mm, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack and an exciting potential. If you can like the, the runoff coefficient on my place is 0.82. It's 80% runoff on a 6% clay slope. If I can have a hundred percent infiltration yeah. every right. year, right? It, that's, that's a game changer. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. Yeah. There's so many places. I mean, most places, most of the water doesn't stay on site. It runs yep. off. And yep. if we could change that, I like saying that if we could change that, then we could solve two thirds of the world's problems. If yep. we could change that, people could grow food and have cool microclimates where they yep. are, there would be a lot less economic deprivation. Yep. If we could just capture and harvest the rainwater on site. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, what you've got going, it doesn't necessarily need electric power. Mm -hmm. uh, it does need a little bit of slope. Yep. So there are constraints, there are limitations, but I mm -hmm. think a lot of people probably have the geography that you need. And it's not just for brittle climates. Um, yeah, that's you know, right. Know, you know, Gay, uh, Joel Salatin is in Virginia, which is very similar to where I am in Kentucky. And he uses gravity fed ponds. And that's yeah. how he feeds all of his cattle. That's how I think that's where he gets most of the water for his crops and his livestock. He has some slope. He got some yep. ponds further up mm -hmm. in the catchment and he uses plastic pipes to channel it downward and it's gravity fed pumps maybe mm -hmm. similar to what you're talking about. Certainly the same general idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, another, I don't have a lot of idea for 
cold climates, but chatting to some people, they were saying that 100% of their rainfall infiltrates, but 50% of their precipitation is in snow. So they can do a similar setup with snow melt, mm -hmm. whether it's pumping during the winter and, and mm -hmm. using that exhaust water for running something like a water wheel or power generation or something, or just in the summer and having that empty dam ready for the snow melt into the swale and filling up. Yeah, um, and, and then, you know, so you're, you've got ponds in your upper elevation. Those yep. ponds, they're helping the water table you know, around them. So it's good for the That's water right. table where the ponds are. Mm -hmm. And then it's good for the water table wherever you feed the water to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it's good yep. for um, I'm repeating myself, but I mean, my God, if, if we could make it so that people could grow food where they are, have cool microclimates where they are, mm -hmm. capture water where they are, and have wildlife habitat where they are, Mm -hmm. um, two thirds of the world's problems would go away tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah. I think what you're doing is very important. Yeah, well, you can think of the exciting potential in the Mediterranean and stuff, where they just don't. Yeah, and Cal California as well. They just yeah. can't get rain inland. Oh my God! I mean, California is only the worst example. I mean, you, you, they're they're trying. They're saying, how quickly can we make this place a desert? How quickly can we're going to do everything wrong and we're going to make this place a desert. We're going to, we're going to bring fossil water up. That's irreplaceable mm -hmm. or, you know, when you bring, when you suck water out of the ground, then the streams tend to run dry. When the streams yep. run dry, your vegetation dies, vegetation dies, then you get flooding and you get low infiltration and you, the more you irrigate, the more salination, sal, salination or salinization. If salinization is a problem, if you if you irrigate more, plus they've got monocrops and they're tilling and they use insecticides mm -hmm. and herbicides. Yep. yep. It's like this is not this this is not that's not how to have abundance. You have a <laughs> few subsidized crop they're subsidized the fossil fuels are subsidized they're subsidized in terms of the um they, we have crop insurance where if your crop fails you mm -hmm. get a government check but it has to be a commodity and then our trade deals are such that we strong arm this is my country we strong arm mm -hmm. small countries into gearing their agriculture to export to us and buying what we export to them. The big corporations, you know, have the advantage, the small producers, it's, 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 it's devastating to small farmers and local economies. It's all about, you know, we're going to see how far we can ship a commodity. We, we ship yeah. rice to Haiti and we devastate the ability of, of Haitian farmers to grow rice. Same for Ghana, same for corn farmers in Mexico. We're just shipping, we're, we're, we're destroying what's called the biodiversity of agriculture. You know, not mm -hmm. just the wildlife biodiversity, but the number of different foods that we have to eat the number of different crops that are, you know, they have kind of some genetic diversity so that some of them are drought proof or some of them are, are like wet soil, dry soil, hot, cold. They have that genetic resilience in them as opposed to a clone, which is just, you know, it's, 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 it's the, it's the worst, but so mm. <laughs> madness. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yep, absolutely. Yeah, well, thanks, Hart. I, I don't want to. Lan, Lan, I'm really sorry for what my country has done to yours and mine. I mean, oh, and, no, and, and Steve, Steve, I'm really sorry that my country has been a horrible example and, and we allow our co corporations to run roughshod over i mean maybe you don't see it that way but that but i'm going to beat up on my country because i can and i will well there's a lot of leaders and innovators um 
in all your passionate soil advocates. Yeah. And the, the Gabe Browns and the yeah. Ray Archuletas and all right. that. So they're, they're changing the world equally and hopefully in the nick of time. We'll see. Right. Well, it looks like that's a good place to wrap up. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. And I uh, hope you come back soon. Uh, this was on short notice. And ho hopefully if we keep, if I keep throwing out topics that are appealing to you, people will want to keep coming back for conversations like this. Steve, uh, definitely, uh, you know, keep us informed and, and put some videos on the group. And we'll mm. keep talking about your system. Thanks, Hart. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Bye, Lyle. Good night. Have a good rest. Thank you. Take care.